We had some technical difficulties there, and it uh, looks like we lost the stream on YouTube, but we, uh, looks like we are back live on Facebook. Let's see. Yep, there we are. Okay, so we're, we're back on Facebook, but uh, apparently there are some issues with YouTube. Uh, YouTube has been updating their terms of service and all kinds of stuff, and um, they may have decided that they didn't want me on YouTube anymore, so who knows. Uh, but we're back on, uh, on Facebook. We're going to continue uh, discussing the question that we had started with concerning the Holy Spirit and how the uh, commenter had said that you can't rely on the written word. You have to have the Holy Spirit telling you what the truth is. You can't just you can't just get the truth from the Bible. You have to have a direct operation of the Holy Spirit. And Frank was doing a good job of uh, responding to that uh, false idea of the working of the Holy Spirit. And so I will let him continue that now that we're back on. Let me go back to John 14. And you can read 14, 15, and 16. They say the same thing. First of all, identifying the Holy Spirit as a person. His purpose to guide into all the truth and to teach whatever Jesus Christ said. But then I guess to answer the question about the Holy Spirit being in a person, guess what? I don't dispute that fact. But what I do dispute is how the Holy Spirit operates in a person. I've got brethren of mine that believe he operates within the person, sometimes say only through the instrument of the word. It's uh, semantics, it doesn't really matter. Uh, but the truth, as you have read so far, is guided by the Holy Spirit. Now notice verse 17 of John 14. I didn't skip it on purpose. Even the Spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive, because it, hath not, uh, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but ye know him, for he dwelleth with you and he shall be in you. I don't dispute that's a fact. In fact, I believe it. But the question is, if he's in you, how does he work? Ephesians 6 and verse 18 says he uses the word of God. The sword of the Spirit is the word of God. It doesn't say anything else about miraculous leanings or emotions or feelings, although in John 20, 30 and verse 31, notice this. Many other signs truly did Jesus do in the presence of his disciples that are not written in this book. But these are written that you might believe, and but believing you might have life everlasting. Notice he said these things are written that you might believe. If the truth was not delivered by the written word, why did Jesus said, I did these miracles to prove it, and these things are written to prove it? He didn't say you're going to keep knowing it by what the Holy Spirit tells you. He said these things are written. And over and over again, Jesus has always appealed to the written word. Matthew chapter 4, when Jesus was tempted three times, you can go and read the whole account when he was in the wilderness, hungry and thirsty. He was tempted three times. You know what his response was three times? It wasn't, I feel, I think, I hope this is going to happen. He says, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. He said, and that's Matthew 4 and verse 4, he said that, three times. Jesus himself appealed to the Word of God as his authority and standard. He didn't go around telling people, well, here's how I feel about it. This is what I think. No, Jesus appealed to the Word of God and he says we should too when he says these things are written that you might believe. Now, I noticed there seems to be some skepticism about the written Word. And so I would like to try to make a point, although I'm not going to great depth, about how to prove that these things that are written in the Bible are actually true. But it's really very simple. If you believe Jesus Christ and what he said so far, and you believe so far that the Holy Spirit gives us all the truth and he's in these people, you got to say, well, when somebody speaks, like it seemed, you seem to doubt us, how do you know that it's true? Well, we can't use the same precise way to do it, but we can compare the Bible to see if it's true because it's the Word of God. 
But let's just go back to the first century and say there were people that believed like you did then. You know, you can't know the truth without the Holy Spirit. Well, God just told them the Holy Spirit was in them. But you know what? They were not expected and the people were not expected just to believe it at their word or at face value. There was proof. There was evidence that what they were saying was true. Brother Norm preaches the truth and he teaches it from the Bible because he can take it and he can prove what he says. And he doesn't have to have the Holy Spirit talk to him because he knows he's not going to. Deliberately speak to him. Look at Mark chapter 16, 15 and 16. These signs shall follow them that believe. Now what are signs? Signs were miraculous pieces of evidence, John 20, 30 and verse 31, that the apostles did to prove that when they spoke, they were speaking the truth, and when they wrote it down, it was the truth. You know, they were serpents, deadly poisons, they were to make the, uh, sick, uh, heal the sick, and to speak in other tongues. A man that could do those things and say, I'm speaking the word of God, the Bible says that's the one that confirms it. It was confirmed by miraculous power. That's how the word initially became truth. And then they wrote it down. And it was passed around for years. I always laugh at people that say, well, without so-and-so, you couldn't have the Bible. Really? I mean, you can't collect a letter and pass it to somebody else and read it? I do it all the time. That's right. That has nothing to do with it. But the power of the Holy Spirit was simply unleashed in these men to teach the truth because God used miraculous power to confirm it. Paul even acknowledged in 1 Corinthians 14, if any man think he's a prophet or spiritual, let him acknowledge that the things I speak or write unto you are the commandments of God. Paul didn't say the Holy Spirit talked to me today and told me to say this. He said, no, these things are written because this is what God showed or revealed to me. And I've written it down. These are God's commandments, not my words. And you know why that's important? Because tomorrow I can wake up and teach something different than I did tonight if the Holy Spirit talked to me. And then I can go Sunday and preach something different if the Holy Spirit talked to me and gave me a different message. Then the following Sunday I could do the same thing. Does that make sense to you? Do you think God is actually like that, that God changes his mind about what's to be taught? You, you can't believe that. You, uh, you can't. You simply can't not believe it's God. Now, if you believe that as a matter of faith, I'll challenge you to prove it. I can prove my faith That's right. about what I believe. I'll tell you how. Romans 10, 17, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. Hearing by what? The Word of God. Not by my feelings and emotions. It's right here. It's not what you feel. It's what God has said. And without faith... It is impossible to please him, for he that cometh to God must believe, have faith that is, that he is and he's a reward of those that diligently seek him. So faith itself and Christianity itself is based upon the word of truth and faith in it. And it's been confirmed by miraculous power. You know, I've had these challenges before to people when I, uh, some people call it sola scriptura, that's what the Catholic Church calls it, and you know, I've had conversations with people, you believe that book is the only thing we need? And I always say, yes, that's the only thing I need. And they start to challenge me about it. And I would just say this to the question or the queries tonight. If you really believe that the Holy Spirit is talking to you, here's what I'd like for you to do. Because this is how the Holy Spirit operated in the first century. Meet me at the graveyard. For every one of them you raise up, I'll tell them to stay down. Make the lame walk, blind see, I believe the Holy Spirit, miraculous power that guides you to tells you what God wants you to know is actually working. If you can't do those things like those in John 20, 31, and Mark 16, you don't have what they have. Because if you had what they had, you could do what they did, but you can't. And that's just the way that works. And by the way, Brother Norm doesn't deny the Holy Spirit's in him. But you know what it takes to get him? Obedience. Acts 5 tells us that. The Holy Spirit resides in every person that obeys God. In every person. So if you're not obeying or following the Word of God, you, you don't have Him. He's not working. He's not in you if you don't obey Him. And see, I'm kind of thinking that probably the reason we have these issues is because people don't really want to look at the Bible and go by it because they don't like the authority. And it also is like that mirror James says. 
You know, when you look in the mirror, it shows you who you really are. You can't hide from that mirror. And that's what the perfect law of liberty is. And you don't like what you see, so you just try to distort the mirror and it makes you feel better. So you just distort what the Holy Spirit does and how he operates and everything's okay. Well, no, it's not okay. It's not okay. Christianity is a system of faith based on the written word of God delivered by the Holy Spirit through the apostles who wrote it down and confirmed it through the miraculous signs. And I just mentioned them. And I was not being sarcastic. I'm not being mean-spirited. But if you have that, that power and the Holy Spirit talks to you, you should do what these men did. And they did those things. They raised people from the dead. They made the lame walk, the blind see. They did a lot of different things. And I'm not, and I, me and Norm don't pick up snakes either. I've had people, won't you pick up a snake? Well, because that wasn't written for me. That was written for those guys. You can pick up a copperhead or a rattlesnake, but you're going to be in the infirmary down at the emergency, center, uh, emergency room if you do. So we, don't, we apply the scriptures as God would have us apply them. And we do it by faith because faith is what saves us. Faith is what saves us. And so we listen to the Spirit. We listen to Him. We're doing it tonight. These scriptures came from the Spirit. It's, tell, it's telling me what to say tonight. That's why I try to quote them or refer to them because that's what He would have me to do. Outside the Spirit, giving me the truth, I don't have any truth. I don't have any revelation. The Spirit is the revelator to man. He's the one that taught us this, and the book was delivered by him. So I don't know where you get these other books and the revel you can't trust Gentiles and stuff. Uh, <laughs> because mostly Jewish people wrote this anyway. I, I hate to disappoint you. Right. Those other books written by Gentiles, I don't believe those books. I don't believe Constantine. Uh, let me make this point. If you think the Bible is unreliable, I wonder, do you believe Aristotle existed? Do you believe Plato existed? Do you believe the philosophers, the Stoics in the first century, do you believe they existed? And if you do, and it seems like you probably read history and you do, do you know that there is less than 20 documents that prove Aristotle and Plato existed? Yet the New Testament has tens of thousands of documents that confirm this word. Why would you accept those people exist and they knew what they were talking about, but not the Word of God? Right. Why? The evidence is enormous. It's enormous. So uh, to, to, to summarize this, the Holy Spirit operates in a person through the Word of God because it is truth, and truth does not change. That's what people get have to understand. The Word of truth doesn't change. You can't say, well, God told me I need to be baptized this week to be saved. And then next week, he said, well, I don't have to do that anymore. And then the following week, he said, well, you don't have to confess. But then the next week, he says, you have to repent. God's no such God. He doesn't change his mind because truth doesn't change. And that's what, dear lady or dear man, that's what you think God is doing today and operating, that his spirit changes the word of truth. The word of truth is stagnant. That's 2 Timothy 3, 16 and verse 17. That's exactly what those passages teach. The scriptures are complete or thoroughly furnished man to every good work by how? Their doctrine, reproof, correction, instruction, and righteousness that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto every good work. There's no opinion or emotion by the Holy Spirit given in there. All scripture is given by God. It is inspired by the Holy Spirit, but notice it's the word that does the things that corrects, reproves, rebukes. It does all of those things. The Holy Spirit's not talking to me right now. If I know whatever I know, I know what he's delivered and I read it. So I have to take odds with you about that. And by the way, if you want to be saved, the Holy Spirit's not going to save you. The Holy Spirit's never saved anybody. True. Only having faith in Jesus Christ and the blood of his sacrifice is going to save you in the gospel that's preached to all nations. The only thing going to save you. That's the only way you can get into the kingdom. You want to get into the kingdom... You're going to have to obey the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we'll come back to that tonight and maybe touch on that some. That's right. Uh, that's a very good points, Frank. And, and while you were going through that, one of the things that just kept coming to my mind that uh, I kept thinking about was what Paul said to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians chapter 4. Uh, they were being rebuked for dividing people up to, to be followers of themselves. Right. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 1, Paul says there, 
or in uh, verse 6, rather, 1 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 6. Now these things, brethren, that is the things he have been talking about, about people getting followers to themselves. Now these things, brethren, I have figuratively transferred to myself and Apollos for your sakes, that you may learn in us not to think. He doesn't even say speak. He said not even to that's, think. That's right. Not to think beyond what is written that none of you may be puffed up on behalf of one against the other. So not to even think beyond what is written. And so it, it always baffles me when somebody says that uh, you need the Holy Spirit, a direct operation of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit uh, operating on your understanding or, or operating on your mind in some direct way to, to, to help you understand the the. Bible, and, and this commenter is not even saying that. This commenter is saying that you don't even have everything you need, and so you need extra stuff from the Holy Spirit. I would ask this question: well, How do you know? That's right. How, how does this person know? For argument's sake, how does this person know that what they're thinking or feeling is the Holy Spirit talking to them? Right. How do they know that? By what standard do you make that judgment? You so, you, you, if you think that the Holy Spirit is flexible and the Word of God moves and changes, you'll never have a standard. That's what we do in the laws of man on this earth. They change all the time. But that's not the way God's law and His covenant with man works. It doesn't change. Jesus Christ is the same today or yesterday, today, and forever. That's a principle that God on His throne is not changing truth. Uh, what, what about uh, this? And, I, and I, I replied to the commenter and, and told the commenter, that on tonight's episode of Bible Q&A, I would prove beyond any shadow of a doubt that they do not have the Holy Spirit. That's the name of tonight's episode. That spirit you got ain't the Holy Spirit, right? And, and I, I'm going to do that here in just a minute. It's just going to take a second. I just got to read her comment, and it's going to prove that she doesn't have the Holy Spirit. But what about this, uh, uh, Frank? And, and what does this say about the idea that you need a direct influence of the Holy Spirit to help you understand the Word of God. In, in, in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17, it's a familiar passage. Oh, yeah. I'm sure we, we all have it memorized. Uh, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect. What? Perfect or complete, right? That's what the, the word perfect means. Complete. complete means he's not lacking anything. So Paul says all Scripture is what makes us complete, thoroughly, look at what he says, thoroughly equipped for almost everything we need to do <laughs> except for what we need the direct operation of the Holy Spirit for. Well, you know as well as I do that's not what it says. It says thoroughly equipped for every good work. So does that passage teach that if I have the inspired Word of God, then I have everything I need to be the person God wants me to be? Is that what Paul teaches there? That, that the Word of God is uh, thoroughly able and it is what God gave to make us complete? So that we, that, that complete means that there's nothing lacking. It means I don't need anything else. So if a person says that you need the, the Bible and the Holy Spirit, isn't that a contradiction of what Paul said right there? Well, of course it is. That's not mentioned anywhere. That's right. If, if you, that's why I opened, look, Norm's making a great point. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God, that's what's, that's, what, that's what's affirmed in 2 Timothy 3, 16, 17. That was my point. You can't have faith without the Word of God. You can't know the truth without the Word of God. And to, to buttress the point, 2 Timothy 1 and verse 13, it says this, Hold fast the form of sound words which you have heard of us or me in faith and love which is in Jesus Christ. Hold fast the form or pattern of words. It didn't say emotions or feelings. 
A pattern is what it's talking about in 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. It says hold fast that pattern, and that's what the Bible is, a pattern of words. He says to hold, he didn't say give them up, don't change them. He says to hold fast to them. I know what hold fast to me. I got a cup right here. If I hold on to that thing fast, it's not going anywhere. And so Norm Friday makes a good point that the scriptures, all the scriptures is what we need to make us perfect. Now, it doesn't mean we're sinless. It doesn't mean we're flawless. It means it completes us. We have everything we need. Exactly. Right? We don't need anything else. And all, in all the epistles, the brethren are encouraged to go back to the word. That's right. They're not, they don't. He doesn't go back and say, wait for the Spirit to talk to you. He always refers back to the Word. Now, the Holy Spirit is mentioned in connection with the truth and that you have the Holy Spirit. We believe that. The Holy Spirit is given to all those that obey Him, Acts 5, 32. When you become a Christian, the Holy Spirit does indwell you, I believe. I do, but it's through the instrument of the Word. Right, and, and, and there, here, here's a couple of passages right along with what you're saying. This, I think the, the, the harmony of these two passages make what you just said irrefutably clear, right? Yes, we have the Holy Spirit in us, but how does the Holy Spirit dwell in us? And, and, and I believe the New Testament is very clear to the fact that it is by means of the Word of God. And, and in Colossians chapter 3 and verse 16, it, it is almost identical to what Paul says in Ephesians chapter 5, verses 18 and 19. Notice here, though, in, in Colossians chapter 3 and verse 16. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. Okay, then you look over at Ephesians chapter 5, verses 18 and 19, it, it, it's almost identical. Let me just read verse 19 first, and, and, and then we'll back up to include verse 18 and, and see what I'm talking about. In Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 19, Paul says the same thing he said to the Colossians, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. Now, in Colossians chapter 3 and verse 16, he prefaced that by saying, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom. Okay, well, let's back up and see how he prefaces that exact same statement or nearly exact same statement here in Ephesians. Backing up to Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 18, he says there, And do not be drunk with wine, in which is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs and making melody in your heart to the Lord. Now, I've asked this question to a lot of people who claim to a direct personal indwelling of the Holy Spirit, some direct operation of the Holy Spirit. I've asked this question to a lot of people and haven't really heard a good answer to it yet from them. I, I pretty well know how you'll answer it, but uh, I haven't, haven't heard a good response to that. Uh, was Paul telling the Corinthians to have the, the word of Christ dwelling in them richly and telling the Ephesians to have something different dwelling in them when he says be filled with the Spirit? No, the or is it the same thing? No, the connection is, that's the connection. Right. The Word indwells a man because the Spirit, the Spirit resides in man with the Word. They're connected. Right. They're not, see, that's what, that's what these queerists want to do. They want to separate the Word of God, the truth, from direct operation of the Holy Spirit. In other words, I, I could say, well, it says you have to be baptized to be saved, Mark 16, verse 16. Oh, well, the Holy Spirit told me something different. No, right. either the Holy Spirit said to be baptized, or he did not. Because the Spirit is the Spirit of truth. And the Spirit of truth is the Word of God. And the sword of the Spirit is what? The Word of God. You right. can't have it both ways. So he wasn't telling the, the, the uh, Colossians one thing and telling the Ephesians something else. Of course not. He was saying the same thing to both. 
Right? When, Just when, with different words, exactly. but they mean the same thing. When, when he says to the Colossians, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, that's the same thing as being filled with the Spirit. Yeah. Being filled with the Spirit is the same thing as having the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom. So, I mean, the, the harmony of those two passages, to me, like I said, make it absolutely clear that the way the Holy Spirit dwells in the child of God is representatively by means of this word, not directly, bodily, physically, metaphysically, supernaturally, whispering in my ear, making the hair stand up on the back of my neck. You know, that's not how the Holy Spirit operates. And you know, one of the things, one of the first things I do anytime somebody tells me that the Holy Spirit told them something. What's that? I say, he told me you're wrong. Yeah. Okay, so now, so now who's... Whose Holy Spirit are you going to listen to? That's, and, and, I, and I'm not lying point. when I say that because the Holy Spirit did tell me he's wrong. He told me uh, they're wrong by means of this word because I know they're not telling me the truth when they tell me that they had the Holy Spirit tell them something. You see, that's the point of, of the Holy Spirit and the truth. If God is true and let every man be a liar, then what makes God true? It's his word. And if God goes back on one thing or had gone back on one thing of his word, he would not be any better than anybody else. But that's not what happened. That's not who he is. So the spirit, which is the third of the Godhead, was given to these apostles. He said, now, I'm going to tell you everything. You need. Don't worry. Don't get upset. I'm going to tell you everything you need to write down and what you preach and what you teach. Don't worry about it. You're going to know all of it. So over time... The Spirit gave an utterance. They wrote it down. But though that age has departed, that, they, everybody wants, they want to go back to this age. But let me take you back to that age for just a minute and show you how you can't possibly have the Holy Spirit, not in the miraculous measure that you're talking about. And this goes along with Brother Norm's point. And I, some people, I guess, are just shocked by this. I, I think there'd be some other people leaning that way would. Turn to Acts chapter 8 if you have your Bible. I'll just read it. It's right off the page with you. It says verse 17, Then they laid their hands on them, and they received the Holy Spirit. Now notice verse 18. And when Simon saw that through the laying on of the apostles' hands the Holy Spirit was given, he offered them money saying, Give me also this power that on whomsoever I lay my hands, he may receive the Holy Spirit. Now, I don't you know, you keep reading, but Peter says, Thy money perish with thee because thou, hast, because thou hast thought that the gift of God may be purchased with money. Uh, thou hast neither part nor lot in this matter, for thy heart's not right with God. So the only way you possibly could have this measure if one of the twelve had put their hand on you, right. then you could get it. But I don't know. I don't think any of them are that old. Well, you know the uh, the Mormon Church does believe that. That's uh, right. John the ba uh, or not John the Baptist, the Apostle John is still alive. <laughs> I Apostle asked John died on at Pratmos. Yeah, I, don't, I'm, <laughs> I know it's debate about the year, but he was the last one to go, probably of natural causes. Right. But my point is, we don't deny. We believe that the filling of the Holy Spirit is when you take this word and put it in your mind. Right. What we differ on is the miraculous gift you seem to think that you have where it tells you something separate and apart from the Bible that leads you to believe it's true. Now, if you say, oh, no, it's the same thing, then I would say, well, you don't need what you got That's because right. we got this. So you can't have it both ways. Either the Holy Spirit operates miraculously today or he does not. We simply know from the evidence that he does not do so. And I can promise you neither Norm nor I get up in the pulpit on Sunday and wait for the Holy Spirit to tell us what to preach. Both of us prepare before we get up there because that would be a short conversation. That's right. Uh, and and, and uh, before we leave this, let me, let me respond directly to the commenter that, that left this comment. Let me read the comment again. And, and I told the commenter in a response uh, to the... Uh, comment that I would prove absolutely that she does not have a direct operation of the Holy Spirit working in her. She's not receiving direct information from the Holy Spirit. Okay, here's the comment. So pastor is discounting the Spirit. Notice there, she calls me pastor. 
So pastor is discounting the spirit. Remove the books and tell me, how do you get revelation? Well, the very simple answer to that is you don't. There's no such thing as revelation from God outside of this book. So she said, remove the books and tell me how you get revelation. Well, you don't. You, there is no revelation outside of those books. Uh, but she goes on and says, why is this pastor, second time she's called me pastor, why is this pastor so bent on the written word only? Because uh, I've tried to be very careful to train myself, as Paul said, not to think beyond what's written. I only want to uh, have in my mind concerning uh, godliness, concerning Christianity, concerning getting to heaven, what is written in this book. Nothing more, nothing less. So that's why I'm, that's why I'm so, how does she put it? That's why I'm so bent on the written word only. But the books were written by man. Okay, uh, well then how do you respond to passages like 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 21 where it says, Holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit or born by the Holy Spirit. Right? So, uh, yes, th this book is written by human beings, but they were Holy Spirit-inspired human beings. That's why there's no mistakes, no contradictions, no uh, mistakes anywhere the Bible touches on any area of science or history or verifiable uh, information. It is always verified correct. It's, it, it has no mistakes in it anywhere. The only explanation for how that's possible is that it's inspired of the Holy Spirit. Exactly. So yes, it's written by men, Holy Spirit-inspired men. You can't lean, I'm quoting again from the, from the comment, you can't lean on those printed words only. Those Gentiles have perverted the words, so you better call upon the Spirit for revelation. Uh, if, if I have to wait for direct revelation, I think Frank made this point too, if I have to wait for direct revelation from the Holy Spirit, then uh, how do I know when I receive it? How do I know whether, whether it is what the Holy Spirit is telling me or it's just what I feel like or it's what I want? You know, uh, I may want to do something that the Bible says I'm not supposed to do. Well, I could look at that and say, oh, those, those Gentiles corrupted that. The Holy Spirit said, I really can do that, right? And, and I think that's, that's typically uh, what tends to happen when you have people claiming a direct operation of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit's never telling them that they can't do something, <laughs> right? The Holy Spirit's always telling them that you can do that. Sure, go ahead and do that, right? So that's uh, a, a very self-centered religion, I think, uh, to say, well, the Holy Spirit... Okay, so if the Holy Spirit's not talking to me, but he's talking to you, then does that mean that God respects you more than me? Which would make God a respecter of persons by necessity which the Bible says he's no respecter of persons. But if people receive direct revelation from the Holy Spirit, then if a person doesn't have that revelation, if a person doesn't know how to be saved, if a person doesn't know how to live a life pleasing to God, well, then it's not their fault. It's God's fault. You're blaming God. You're blaming God for someone not knowing the truth because God didn't give them the Holy Spirit to tell them. And that's uh, not something I would want to uh, have to face in judgment. That's, I would say that's pretty close to what Jesus called the unpardonable sin, uh, <coughs> blaspheming the Holy Spirit. Because you're blaspheming God by saying anybody who doesn't know the truth, it's because God didn't give it to them. It's because God didn't respect them enough to give them the truth. You're impugning the character of God. Okay, then there's a follow-up comment. I, I, I replied back, invited, as I usually do with comments like this, and, and invited the commenter to watch Bible Q&A tonight and to take part in the live discussion. Uh, so she replied back. Now notice, Pastor Norm. That's what, third or fourth time? Third time. Thir third least. time. Third time, Pastor Norm. And, you know, when I read that, Pastor Norm, I thought, well, maybe that's why she thinks she needs 
a direct operation of the Holy Spirit because she can't read. Because it says really clearly on my YouTube page, Preacher Norm. So apparently she can't read because she keeps calling me Pastor Norm. Uh, but I know she can because she wrote these comments. So I'm being facetious, of course. The Pastor Norm, before you answer this question, please make sure to dig up all those books and scrolls that Constantine and the other Gentiles and Romans have conveniently left out. Now she's talking about mm -hmm. she's talking about all the apocryphal books yeah. there, and like, uh, have you ever read the? Uh, what is it? The Gospel of Judas, I think, is one of the most recent ones. Yeah, other Gospel of Thomas. You ever read any Maccabees, of those? Maccabees, yeah. Uh, I've read, I don't know it in great detail, but I've read through it some. You know, when I, I remember when all of the uh, the media uproar and uh, uh, hysteria, and it really was kind of hysteria. National Geographic was doing programs on it, and people were talking about the Gospel of Judas and this lost book of the Bible. And well, I got it and read it. I went to the library, checked it out, and got it and read it. It talked about uh, the fact that Mary couldn't be saved because she was a woman, and Jesus said, it's okay, she's becoming a man. So, you know, transgenderism way back then, right? She's becoming a man so that she can be saved. Well, that's Gnostic. Gnostics believe that, that women were the epitome of evil. And so Jesus said, well, Mary can be saved because she's becoming a man. Now, are you telling me that that's supposed to be in my Bible? And not only that, but it has them addressing the luminaries and bythos and ethos and all these Gnostic deities and, and praying to angels. And it, it's, it's a Gnostic letter. And you want to try to tell me that I don't have the complete word of God because junk like that isn't in it? If, if stuff like that was in it, it would, it would uh, uh, cause people to, to doubt the veracity of, of the other really inspired books. And, and so... This idea that there's lost books of the Bible, there's things that we don't have, it's just simply not true. It, it, it's not true. And so uh, she says, uh, the word says. Now, now th that's what really kills me, Frank. Uh, now, here's somebody all through this comment has been saying you can't count on this. Right. You need the Holy Spirit because this has been corrupted. These filthy Gentiles have messed up the Bible. That's pretty much her comment. And then turns around and says, the word says. Now, why would I listen to this person quote anything from the Bible when they very clearly don't believe that the Bible is the inspired word of God? But she says, the word says God is a spirit, which is actually not what it says. Jesus said, God is spirit. And those that worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. She said, God is a spirit. They that worship God must worship him in what? Spirit and in truth. Now, uh, quoting that verse like that is very clear that she has no clue what worshiping God in spirit and in truth means. Spirit there is not talking about the Holy Spirit. Spirit there is talking about my attitude in worship to God. So, now how do I know that this person that is claiming to have the Holy Spirit does not have the Holy Spirit giving them... Now, she's claiming direct revelation from the Holy Spirit. How do I know for a fact that she does not have the Holy Spirit? How many times did she call me pastor? Three times. Am I a pastor? No. Do you think the Holy Spirit knows the difference between a pastor and a preacher? I do, and the Bible tells us the difference. <laughs> yeah, uh, the, the Holy Spirit is not going to contradict himself. I'm not a pastor. And what Norm is referring to is a pastor is a term for an elder in the congregation, right. but it is not necessarily the preacher. He can be both. Like you, have you, to be. you are, right? I, yeah, I'm, I am. But if somebody calls me pastor in the sense of giving me a title, right. I quickly say I'm just a preacher That's right. or I'm a minister or a servant. I don't claim any. And that really the reason why is because God did not mean for us to have those titles. He just meant those as descriptions as to the role that you play in a congregation. Norm preaches. He's got elders or pastors that he is who supervise him. Shepherds. Their right. overseers are shepherds. Same, same word, pastor and shepherds. If you same said word. pastors in plural sense, you would have it right. If there were two men here tonight qualified or had that role in my office, you could say that as a description, but neither one of us accept titles. We don't go by reverend. That's right. We don't go by pastor. We don't go by shepherd. We just go by brother or some people describe us by preacher, minister. That's fine, but we don't 
us, uh, we don't describe religious titles to our names. We right. don't do it because it's not, it's not appropriate and God doesn't like it. Right. Preacher, elder, uh, bishop, overseer, those are, those are uh, descriptive designations for a role that is being served. They're not titles. And so uh, it's, I mean, that makes it really easy to prove that this person is, is not receiving direct information from the Holy Spirit. By the way, it's in 1 Timothy chapter 3 is where the, that's right. what the Holy Spirit actually said about the pastor. That's right. 1 Timothy 3, 1 through 7, the qualifications are given there. It's not the preacher. Uh, the only qualifications that's given for preachers is that they're faithful men. The, the, the things that you have heard of me, 2 Timothy 2, 2, mm -hmm. teach to faithful men that they may be able to teach others also. That's the qualification of a preacher is to be a faithful man. But the, the, the elders or the pastors, shepherds, they have very specific qualifications that they have to meet. Do you have that? Yeah, it's first Timothy chapter 3. Uh, this is a true saying, if a man desire the office of bishop, he desireth a good work. A bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, vigilant, sober, good behavior, given to hospitality and able or apt to teach, not given to wine, no striker, that means don't go around fighting, mm -hmm. not greedy or filthy lucre, but patient, not a brawler, pretentious, not covetous, no lover of money, one that ruleth well his house, having his children in subjection with all gravity. For if a man know not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God, but be he cannot be a novice, lest being lifted up with pride, he fall into the condemnation of the devil. Moreover, he must have good report of them which are without, lest he fall into reproach of the snare of the devil. That without means people that are not in his congregation, but people in public. They can't defame his character. So those are the qualifications of an elder, shepherd, bishop, episcopos, pastor, whatever you want to attach to it as far as the Greek names, but preachers don't have to be that. Preacher does not have to be married. He don't have to. Uh, he's, he just doesn't have to have that role. The reason I would say a pastor needs to be married is because he needs to know how to deal with other people and other folks in a very interpersonal way because it's actually a family, and so it's very difficult for a single man. Obviously, may can relate to him, might can teach him, but it's probably as far as on a personal level and being empathetic towards those people, it might be a little bit different. I, I don't know. I just know that's why God that God put those qualifications for that. So, and two, it's the it's the evidence uh, of this family man that people under his leadership are uh, he he he's led them in a way that they're spiritually healthy people, and, and so that's the person that you want leading the congregation. And he's supposed to be a man of very important, a man that's lived a while, that's right. experienced a lot of things. Because in your congregation, you're going to have people that's experienced a lot of things. So. Uh, that, that's just a misnomer, and you're exactly right. Uh, the Holy Spirit doesn't call you a pastor. He doesn't call me that's one right. either. That's right. He wouldn't sit there and call me one, though I may function as that role. He would just say this is a preacher, minister, or brother that's in the right. Lord. That's how he would describe it, but you're exactly right. The Holy Spirit so, doesn't do that. So the fact that she keeps calling me pastor when I'm not a pastor, uh, I know yeah. for a fact the Holy Spirit's not telling her I'm a pastor. So the spirit she's got is not the Holy Spirit. Uh let me go back to my uh, comments here, uh, or my response to her comment. Uh, I, I said to her, if you have the Holy Spirit, why are you calling me pastor when I'm not a pastor? I know you don't have the Holy Spirit giving you direct knowledge and guidance because the Holy Spirit knows the difference between a pastor and a preacher. 1 Timothy 3, 1-7, as, as Frank just went through the qualifications there. The Holy Spirit knows that. The Holy Spirit gave that. It's from the inspiration of the Holy Spirit that we have the qualification of elders. So uh, the Holy Spirit wouldn't be calling me a pastor. Don't you believe that the men who wrote the Bible were guided by the Holy Spirit? I made reference to this a minute ago. 2 Peter 1, 19-21. Peter said no prophecy has uh, uh, come of any private interpretation, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. Uh, so do you believe that the men who wrote the Bible were inspired of the Holy Spirit? Because it doesn't sound like you do. Sounds like you, sounds like you believe you're inspired by the Holy Spirit, and these men weren't. And, and I definitely would not listen to somebody that, that uh, was, was giving that impression. Uh, not under any circumstances. Uh, do you believe the promise of God? And I think this is a very important point. 
and uh, I'll bring Frank back in the, in the shot to uh, comment on this. Don't you believe the promise of God to preserve his word? Because in your comments, you're talking about how uh, people have corrupted the word of God, that the, the, the Constantine and Gentiles, Romans, you, you say, corrupted the word of God, that there's a bunch of stuff left out. But didn't God make a promise to preserve his word? Uh, 1 Peter chapter 1 Verse 22 begins, Since you have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit and sincere love of the brethren, love one another fervently with a pure heart, having been born again, not of corruptible seed but incorruptible, through the Word of God. How are we born again? Through the Word of God. Through the Word of God, which lives and abides forever. Because all flesh is as grass and all the glory of man as the flower of the grass. The grass withers and its flower falls away. But the word of the Lord, what? Endures forever. Right? So is that a promise that we will always have this word? It's exactly a promise. So when somebody starts saying that, you know, the, the, the word of God is corrupted, uh, we can't rely on the Bible because, you know, there's missing books. And, well, God said his word word would endure forever because it's the incorruptible seed by which we must be born again we can't be born again without without the word of god because it's in the word of god that we we learn how to be children of god we we as as frank quoted earlier faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of god romans 10 17 without faith it is impossible to please him hebrews eleven six. Uh, believing what the Word of God teaches about Christ and His kingdom, Acts 8, 12, I have to repent of my sins, Acts 17, 30, and 31. Repenting of my sins, I have to confess that I believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Uh, Romans chapter 10, verses 9 and 10, making that confession with the mouth unto salvation. I have to be baptized into Christ to have my sins washed away by His blood, Acts 22 and verse 16. The Holy Spirit laid it all out, Peter says that we're born again through the word of God, which lives and abides forever. So if, any, if, if something ever happened to the word of God, people wouldn't be able to know how to be saved. That's in Acts chapter 8. Didn't Paul say the spirit bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God? Because when, when I go to, to the word of God and I read what the Holy Spirit revealed about how to be born again, and I know I did that. Well, that's the Spirit's witness with my spirit that I have been born again, that I have become a child of God. Not only that, but when I'm living the lifestyle that the Holy Spirit describes for the child of God in the New Testament, and, and, and I know that the way that I'm living matches what the, the New Testament says for how a child of God is supposed to live. That's the Holy Spirit bearing witness with my spirit that I am a child of God because I did what it took, according to the revelation of the Holy Spirit, to become a child of God. I'm living the way that the Holy Spirit says in this inspired word that a child of God is supposed to live. And in that way, the Holy Spirit is bearing witness with my spirit that I am a child of God. And so if, if something happened to the word of God, we wouldn't know how to be saved. We wouldn't know how to live the, the redeemed life. We wouldn't know how to live like saved people. Um, what about uh, John chapter 12 and verse 48, Frank? Well, the Bible makes it very plain that our judgment before the throne of God after we die, Hebrews 9 verse 27, poor young man wants to die, then the judgment is going to be based not on the unction of the Holy Spirit, not on your feelings, not what you think or thought, but on the word of God. Notice what he says in John 12 verse 48, he that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words has one that judges him. The word that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. You are endangering or imperiling your soul on the day of judgment if you think or you believe or you operate on what you believe some voice or Holy Spirit, as you call him, is talking to you. I want to make one other point about this power that we're talking about. That same Peter that Brother Norm read from so aptly a while ago also wrote this. 2 Peter 1 and verse 3, According as his divine power has given us all 
things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him who has called us to glory and virtue. God's power has given me all things that I need to know through the knowledge of Jesus Christ. Now, let me ask this being facetious or rhetorical. If I close this Bible up tonight and I never read it and I have never been taught about Jesus, how would I know? How would I know him? If all power is coming through the knowledge of Jesus Christ, where would you go to find out about Jesus Christ other than the Bible? You, you would not even know. You wouldn't know a third of what he'd done. And the Bible has only got Jesus pretty much his life in three or in four books, the Gospels. So you wouldn't, wouldn't know him without the written word. Nobody in this dispensation of time would know Jesus without the written word. And the Bible plainly states to Peter, he's given us all things that pertain unto life and godliness. I think that's a pretty good recommendation alongside 2 Timothy 3 and verse 16 and verse 17. All scripture is given by inspiration of God as props for doctrine, proof, correction, instruction, and righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto every good work. All is all. And let me ask just another rhetorical question. If you had all the money in the world, would anybody else have any of it? No. <laughs> I mean, it's, that's just how important that is. All scripture is all scripture. All things that I need have been given to me. So why do I need, if I have all scripture and all the things that pertain to life and godliness, why would I need the Spirit to speak to me in my mind today? That's right. If I've got it all, there's nothing left for him to do. And in fact, the miraculous power that he had, is that's exactly right. He's not operating that way because he's finished his work in the regards to revelation. So there's no need to confirm it anymore because it's already been done. That's right. And that's seemingly, that's what people want today. Well, I want a sign. Well, God's already given the signs. He's already given the evidence. Uh, I'm amazing. Uh, you know, if you pick up your birth certificate, you got your name on it, your blood type, and who your parents were. And probably it's probated uh, at the health department or by a judge. Now, you probably believe that. I do. I believe when I was born. Uh, if you can accept that evidence from man, why can't you accept evidence from these men who did miracles to prove it? I'm just at a loss at the thought process that we're going through here with this Holy Spirit needing to talk to me. It just really uh, is confusing to me. And it's not really rational thought. Uh, that's why I make those points. I'm trying to get you to start to think along the lines of taking evidence and processing it instead of relying on your feelings and emotions. That's why people don't obey the gospel, by the way, because of their own personal feelings and emotions. I'll obey this, but I don't like that one. I disagree with that one, but I'll go along with that one. It's not the way the Holy Spirit guides us. He guides us into all the truth. That's right. And you know, if, if Jesus said there, the word that I have spoken will judge him in the last day, doesn't that mean that his word is going to be there in the last day? Exactly. What about uh, Revelation? Chapter 20, verses 11 and 12. There's a picture there of the last day That's right. and what's opened up there on the last day. The books. The books. Well, for the books to be opened up there on the last day and the men uh, or uh, the people gathered before the throne there are judged according to their works based on the things written in the books, doesn't that mean the books are going to be there in the last day? Oh, exactly. So, uh, you know, for somebody to say and... It, it, it seems to be fairly common amongst the more cultic religions, I guess, would be like Jehovah's Witnesses. Uh, a lot of Pentecostal churches have that idea that uh, we, we need this uh, direct operation of the Holy Spirit because the, the, the revealed word, they wouldn't even call it the revealed word. They say the, 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 the Bible has been corrupted over the years and we need the Holy Spirit to help us, you know, work through those problems. And, and, and uh, I, I don't understand how they can look at these passages like this where it says that the word of the Lord endures forever. My words will judge him in the last day. The books are opened at the judgment scene. And, and think that the Bible, that God hasn't promised that as long as we need salvation, which is going to be until Christ comes back, we're going to have this word to teach us the way of salvation. I'm curious also as to what part of it's corrupted. 
Well, have, that, you ever, have you ever had somebody actually answer that when they say it's been corrupted? I always wonder, well, okay, if it is, well, explain to me and show me uh, how it's been corrupted. I'd like to know what part of it is not true. And then I would say this, if you believe it's true, what are, how are you measuring to know it's corrupted? Right. How, how you know, do you know that? One example I had of that, and it's only, it's only happened this one time. Like you say, you know, you ask, well, where's, show me where it's corrupted. Where's the example of the corruption? And, and they have some, you know, wild, like, like, like this comment, you know, that Constantine hid some of the books and, you know, talking about these Gnostic writings that they think need to be in the Bible. Uh, that they'll say something, you know, kind of off the wall like that. But uh, I had a study with Jehovah's Witnesses and they said they wanted to study about the name of God. And so I said, okay, well, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll have a study about the name of God. So I got their book. They, they got that little book, Reasoning from the Scriptures. I got their book. And in one place in their book, it says that the uh, New Testament is completely reliable in every aspect. Completely, totally reliable. It's interesting. In another part of that same book, it says that the name Jehovah has been taken out of the New Testament and you can't rely on the New Testament when it comes to the name of God. So when, when we were talking about the name of God, I reached over in my bag and I pulled out their book. And when I pulled out their book, their eyes went like this. And because, you know, they don't like for people to, you know, get get a hold of that. Uh, it's they're, they're, Have you ever seen that book, Reasoning from the Scriptures? No, I haven't seen that one. They, they've got uh, common questions that people ask. And then they've got the answers to those questions. That's why when you're studying with the Jehovah's Witness, a lot of times you'll see them flipping in a little book before they... Give I've studied answer. with them before. I was wondering yeah. where that came from. And, and, and you know, the, so that's their little book. Well, I was able to get one. And so I had both these places uh, marked in, in, in their book. Uh -huh. And, and uh, I said, well, you know, Jehovah is a, is a, a Hebrew tetragrammaton. It, you can't translate that into Greek. Even, even if you wanted to, you couldn't translate that. You could maybe transliterate it somewhat like we do into English, but... It's not in the Greek because it can't be translated into Greek. That's why they translated it as Lord in the New Testament. And that's where the, the, the custom comes from of translating it Lord, all capital letters in the Old Testament. Because when you see Old Testament quotations in the New Testament, the New Testament quoter uses the word Lord in the New Testament. So that, that's how that got in the Old Testament there instead of Jehovah. Uh, but... In, in saying this, that you can't put, Joe, they, of course, they denied that mm -hmm. and, and wanted to argue about it. And uh, so I pulled out their book and, and I said, well, you're saying that I can't trust the New Testament when it comes to the name of God because it's been, it's been corrupted. It, people have taken the name of God out of the New Testament. Uh, and, and, and they said, yes, that's right. And I said, well, that's interesting because in your book, and I flipped it open <laughs> to where it says in their book, that the New Testament is completely reliable in every aspect. I said, in your book right here, it says that the New Testament is completely reliable. But, oh yeah, it does say over here this contradictory statement about it can't be relied on for, for the name of God. So which is it? Is it completely reliable or has it been corrupted and can't be relied on when it comes to the name of God? You know, I, I don't think I've ever seen people conclude a Bible study faster than, <laughs> than they did that day. Because once they knew I had their book and I, and I knew what they were doing, they, they weren't interested. Right. I've actually had Jehovah's Witnesses tell me that they're looking for people to study with that don't think they already know the Bible. <laughs> so, At uh, least they're honest about that. Huh? So that, that's, that's one example where I've seen where they've said, okay, in this way, it's not reliable. Which isn't even a genuine uh, uh, claim. Like I said, you can't translate Jehovah into Greek. It, it, it's, it's not translatable. I was just reading a passage. You caught me off guard, but I was just reading a passage related to this discussion mm -hmm. about the books. And we were talking about John 12, verse 48. You go to the end of Revelation, you don't find the reference to the Holy Spirit passing judgment. You, in fact, you don't find it anywhere. But you know what you do find? A reference to the book. That's right. Look at uh, Revelation 20, verse 15. And whoso was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Now, are you going to live your life 
listening to a voice or following the book. That's right. Based on that, which one would you do? If you read that passage, which one would you do? Would you follow the voice or would you follow the book? Now, if the voice that you think you have is telling you the same thing as the book, you don't need to listen to the voice because you got the book. So something's different here. And I would suggest to you, as far as your salvation goes, you need to get into the book because only the word of truth is going to save you. Not an unction, not a feeling, not a provocation. James 1 and verse 18 says, By his own will we were begotten by the word of truth, that we might be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. You're not going to be saved without the word of God. Nothing's going to happen that's going to come into your mind and zap you or whatever feeling that you get that tells you you're saved by some feeling. It's by the word of God that you're going to be saved. And in the judgment day, your name better be written in the book of life. That's right. See, all of this is something that Jesus appealed to. Jesus did not go around appealing to the Holy Spirit. You won't find that anywhere in the Bible. But Jesus did appeal to the word. Well, what did he say? What did he say when he was tempted? Did he say, "Holy Spirit, help me"? No, it is written. He said, "It is three written times. three times." And, and you know, the, the the way that I've explained that a lot of times is that if if Jesus had used his divine power in some way to dispel the devil or to to avoid those temptations, well, then that couldn't have been an example for us. But the way he overcame those temptations is in an example we can follow. We can say when we're tempted, it is written. I'm going to follow what this says rather than giving in to this temptation. So uh, that, that, that's, a, that's a great point. He didn't appeal to the Holy Spirit. He, he appealed to the, to, the, to the law that he was under. And I would go further and say this. There's three in the Godhead. First John 5, 7, you can go to creation, Genesis 1, and see all three of them. Mm -hmm. John 1, you see God and Jesus. But don't you think, or does it not make sense, if the Holy Spirit could have helped Jesus out of temptation in the wilderness, he would have just asked him to do it and been done with it? That's right. If, if Jesus didn't know he could use him, what makes <laughs> me think I can listen to him now yeah, and get him to do what I want to do? You, just, you understand what I'm saying? That, yeah, that's Does right. it not make rational if Jesus didn't appeal to him to get him to help him to do what he needed to do, how do you think we're going to do it? When Jesus is a part of the Godhead with the Holy Spirit, that would have been a perfect time to do that. Or I'll tell you an even better time when he was being crucified. He didn't appeal to the Holy Spirit. He appealed to the Father. You won't see him saying, Holy Spirit, come get me off his cross. Yeah. Although the, there's a prophet that says he could have called legions of angels. But he never appeals to that. He always appeals to the Father because that was the way the order was set up. God the Father, God the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And if you look at Matthew 28 under the authority, that's exactly the way it is. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. He's the third one. I'm not saying he's not equal, but they all have different functions. Uh, the Holy Spirit's not Jesus, and the Holy Spirit's not God in the sense of their personality. And sometimes we want to give them credit for that. But the truth comes from the Father. He uses the Holy Spirit to tell the truth. And he uses Jesus in his death, burial, and resurrection to verify the truth. That's how it actually works in the scriptures. Well, it's been a, a very interesting discussion. Uh, we had some technical difficulties getting started out, but we were able to get back online and uh, continue the discussion. And uh, this is the first time I've, I've had a... Uh, guest on with me and I have really enjoyed it Frank and I am too. Uh, uh, I appreciate you we, having me we, 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 we have good discussions uh, when we get together and uh, I wanted to bring you on Bible Q&A so that they could hear the kind of good discussions that that you you bring up well, thank you uh, me and Frank do uh, know your Bible together a lot of times in Columbus like I said Frank is the uh, preacher at a sister congregation here in LaGrange uh, the Northside Church of Christ, of, of course, is where I would love for you to visit when you're here. 1101 Hogansville Road, LaGrange, Georgia. But uh, if Frank has his say, he wants you to visit <laughs> Bartley Road. Where, 1638 where? Bartley Road. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, if you visit either congregation, I am very, I can say very confidently you will worship God in spirit and in truth at either congregation. Absolutely. But, of course, you would enjoy it more at, at uh, Northside. <laughs> Thank you, Frank. I've enjoyed it. Thank you, Norm. I appreciate right. it very much. Uh, thanks for watching Bible Q&A tonight. Until next week, I'm going I'm to try to get Frank on with me more often. 
Uh, so hopefully I'm maybe getting back next week. I'll be glad to do it. We'll uh, we'll see you then.